<clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us today for this, the second event in VIU's Arts and Humanities Colloquium Series for Fall 2018. I'm Dr. Tim Lewis, Chair of the VIU History Department, and it is my sincere pleasure to serve as MC for each of the colloquium events this year. I want to begin by acknowledging that we have the great honor today of meeting on the traditional territory of the Sunamo First Nation. Please be appreciative of that fact and be alert for opportunities to further the process of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. I also want to express the Colloquium Planning Committee's sincere gratitude for the moral and financial support the series continues to receive from the Office of the Dean of Arts and Humanities, led by Dr. Marnie Stanley. We could not do this work without that support. Now, I must confess, because I'm a historian, to being just a bit more excited about this colloquium than most. First, our presenter this morning, Dr. Catherine Spence, is a fellow historian who joined our department in 2016. And I do enjoy a good history lecture, and that's what you're going to get this morning. Plus, today's topic arises from Catherine's celebrated research on early modern Scotland. And I do have a wee bit of Scots blood in me. <laughs> One of my great grannies was a Lindsay, thus I'm sporting the Lindsay tartan tie today. Uh, so I thought to get us all feeling just a wee bit more Scottish, uh, I, we'd kick things off with a rendition of the unofficial Scottish anthem, Flower of Scotland. Now, to truly appreciate this song, you probably need to be in a crowd of 40 or 50,000 Scots football or rugby fans who've all had a few of their favorite beverages and are ready to belt out this tune, hating the English with every single syllable. <laughs> ah, yeah. And it should start with a skirl of the pipes. But I'm all you've got, so here goes. <clears throat> O oh, flower of Scotland, when will we see your like again that fought and died for your wee bit hill and glen and stood against him? Proud Edward's army and sent him homeward to think again. Those days are past now, and in the past they must remain. But we can still rise now and be the nation again that stood against him. Proud Edward's army and sent him homeward to think again. Go Scotland. Aye, <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah. makes you want to kick an Englishman, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. Now, there's one other reason I chose to present Flower of Scotland, and that's because VIU's longtime Dean of Arts and Humanities, Dr. Ross McKay, who I was hoping would be here today, but I'm not sure he made it. You'll have to tell him about this if he, if he isn't here. Uh, Ross, of course, did so much to support uh, the work of the colloquium and the Arts and Humanities faculty as a whole before moving on to his current vice presidential role. And of course, he's also of Scottish heritage, Ross McKay, uh, hailing from Glace Bay, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, but as Scottish a place as you can be in Canada. So here's one last big colloquium thank you to Ross with a Flower of Scotland twist I've entitled Proud Son of Glace Bay. So, <clears throat> oh, proud son of Glace Bay, we praise your name for all you do to fund the colloquium and be our brave leader too who stands against those who question the value of arts and humanities in our world today. Neoliberals tell us our days are past, 
and past we must remain, but we will yet rise now to prove we're worthy again, to stand against those who question the value of arts and humanities in our world today. So thank you, Ross McKay. We're with you all the way. The arts are here to stay. What's that? Wrap it up? OK. <laughs> Uh, we'll get things back underway before they suspend my pay. So here's the last thing I'll say. Way to go, Ross McKay. Mm. There we go. Thanks for that. So now that I'm done with Ross, uh, Marnie gets to be the new target of all this silliness. Uh, uh, heading, uh, heading for it. Now, Let's get things back on track. Please join me in welcoming to the stage another of my colleagues from the VIU History Department, Dr. Catherine Rollwagon. Catherine is the chair of the VIU Arts and Humanities Colloquium Planning Committee. And this morning, she's also here to introduce today's featured speaker, the other member of VIU's History Department's team, Catherine, Dr. Catherine Spence. So, Dr. Catherine Rollwagon. It is my pleasure this morning to tell you a little bit about my colleague, Catherine Spence, especially because she is a historian of women and gender, and October is, as many of you hopefully know, Women's History Month. Catherine hails from New Brunswick. She completed her BA in Journalism and History at the University of King's College in Halifax, and worked as a journalist before deciding to pursue graduate studies in history. First at the University of Guelph and then at the University of Edinburgh, Catherine investigated the history of women's economic roles in early modern Scotland, and she won several prestigious awards for her work. After completing her PhD at the University of Edinburgh, she continued her research as a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada postdoctoral fellow, and she co-edited the Edinburgh House, House Mail's taxation book. And she also published her own book based on her thesis, Women, Credit, and Debt in Early Modern Scottish Towns. Um, and this book, published in 2016, won the Women's History Network Book Prize in 2017, where it was praised as a meticulously researched and convincing argument of women's involvement in economic activity in early modern Scotland. Catherine has taught at universities in Edinburgh, Staffordshire, in England, uh, Guelph, Ontario, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and St. John, New Brunswick. She became part of our department here at VIU in 2016 and quickly showed everyone uh, that she was both a generous and, given her accomplishments to date, an exceedingly modest colleague. In addition to teaching a variety of new and popular history courses in our department, she has published three peer review articles, and is the recipient of this year's Dean's Scholarship Research and Creative Activity Award here at VIU. Catherine is now an editor of the international journal Gender and History, along with Dr. Cheryl Warsh and myself here at VIU. And so I have the pleasure of working alongside her every day and seeing firsthand her dedication to scholarship and her commitment to her students. However, I have not yet had the pleasure that we are all going to enjoy this morning of hearing Catherine present her own very impressive research. And so I'm very much looking forward to her talk today. Without further ado, please welcome Dr. Catherine Spence. Thank you, though I, I feel that, that you're going to be disappointed um, because I'm, I'm not going to sing. And, um, <laughs> And I apologize for that. Well, well, actually, I, I don't. Um, I would apologize if I was going to do that. All right. Instead, we'll get to, uh, we'll get to my, my talk today. Now, two days before her death, on October 29, 1597, an Edinburgh woman named Margaret Skirling called together family and friends to oversee the making of her testament, her latter will, and her legacy. Now, during the writing of her will, Margaret completed several tasks. She appointed her second husband, John Davidson, as executor of her testament. She made provisions for the upbringing and education of her two children, named John and Sarah. 
and these two children were the products of her first marriage. And finally, she made bequests to both family, friends, and servants. In particular, Margaret left her mother two cloaks. She left her sister a red underskirt with a red bodice and a pair of silver clasps. She left her daughter two gowns, a cloak, a red underskirt, a silver belt, and the rest of her personal effects. Finally, two female servants were left money. They were left 20 shillings each. Now, the, ma the importance of making a will in modern society, where we have our investments, we have our properties, we have our consumer culture that leads, leaves us with a great number of things, usually, upon our death. So the importance of making a will in modern society is very clear. But as Margaret's and other early modern testaments show, making a will was no less important in the early modern period. If the majority of people who lived back then owned relatively few possessions, especially compared to what we own today, the importance of those items cannot be overstated. Also important in the early modern period was, uh, was the who was making a will, the people who were making a will. So this presentation examines will making in 16th, uh, 16th century Scotland, focusing on women's wills. Now, in particular, while this presentation will address the wills written by single women, including women who were widows, women who were servants, and women who had never been married, it will primarily examine the will-making practices of women who were wives. Because while testament writing was a right that was theoretically open to all members of society in Scotland in this period, a married woman required her husband's consent to write a will. So as such, this presentation considers both the proportion of surviving 16th century Scottish testaments, which were written by women, and by wives in particular, and also how the practice of will-making was gendered, and how marital status influenced a woman's ability to write a will. Now, you're all likely familiar with Scotland, either personally or through film and television shows, such as Braveheart, Rain, Outlander. Not that I would suggest that any of those are actually, uh, are actually historically accurate. In fact, if I, I, could have, I could have talked for 15 minutes about how Braveheart is historically inaccurate. Um, however, we do have, uh, Scottish historians do have very high hopes for Outlaw King, which is debuting on Netflix um, in November. So hopefully, hopefully we'll finally have our film that actually depicts medieval Scotland. Although I have heard Robert the Bruce being described as a very pious man. I take issue with that. He murdered his rival in a church. He gets excommunicated for it. So I'm not so sure. But like I say, we, we, we're keeping our fingers crossed. But anyways, now, that, now one of the four nations that make up the United Kingdom, Scotland in the 16th century was its own country, though it maintained close relationships with England and Europe. Its relationship with England grew even closer in 1603. Because in 1603, England's queen, Elizabeth I, died. The king at that point in Scotland was James VI. Now, James VI was also the first cousin twice removed of Elizabeth I. And so, he also becomes King of England in that year. Now, this process was known as the Union of the Crowns. And Scotland and England are, from this point forward, ruled by the same monarch. And interestingly, James, once he travels down to England in 1603, he only returns to Scotland once um, before he dies. He returns in 1617. Now, while Scotland and England were ruled by the same monarch from 1603, they continue to maintain separate parliaments. And they'll maintain separate parliaments from 1603 until 1707, when a further union between the two countries, known as the Union of the Parliaments, occurs. Now, at that point in 1707, parliamentary power for both countries is held in England. 
Scotland, or, and Edinburgh in particular, still maintains governance to some degree over Scotland, to some degree over Scotland. But like I say, parliamentary power is very much centered in England from this point. Now this power is devolved in 1997 when Scotland regains its parliament. And of course, current political changes in Scotland and in the United Kingdom, including the election of the Scottish National Party in Scotland and the current Brexit negotiations, I mean it remains to be seen whether the relationship between Scotland and England will see further splintering. But for the period that I'll be speaking about today, the late 16th and a bit into the early 17th centuries, Scotland needs to be seen as distinct from England. The two countries share a landmass, but in the 16th century they don't yet share a monarch. Religiously, both would embrace the Reformation. Both would embrace Protestantism. England would do so in the 1530s. Scotland would do so by an act of Parliament in 1560. But England would choose to follow Anglicanism, while Scotland would embrace Calvinism, a branch of Protestantism that came to the country from the European continent. Now, this switch to Calvinism uh, precipitates a significant increase in the number of courts and as a result, the number of records, as well as the frequency of documents being written in the vernacular. Previously, they would have been written in Latin. So all of this has great significance on what we know about Scotland, particularly from the latter half of the 16th century on. Now, economically, England and Scotland both used the pound. But by 1600, Scotland's pound would be worth only one twelfth that of an English pound. Scotland also used a monetary de uh, denomination known as a merc, and this was worth 13 shillings and four pence. Scottish towns were also tended to be much smaller than did English towns. So the largest and most important town in Scotland in the 16th century was Edinburgh. And by, at about 1600, uh, Edinburgh would have had a population of about 25,000 people, so large for Scotland, not so much large for other areas of Europe. The other most populous towns in Scotland in, in this period were Aberdeen, Dundee, and Perth. And each of these towns would have had a population between five and 10,000 people. Other Scottish towns would have been much smaller, including Glasgow, which would not gain prominence until the 18th century. Now, linguistically, Scottish people spoke and wrote in Scots, which was a dialect of English. Overall then, Scotland was different to England, and this is illustrated in yet another way, and that's through Scottish wills and testaments. Now, Scottish testaments are held by the National Records of Scotland, and all Scottish testaments have been digitized. Now, as a result of this digitization process, they can be accessed one of two ways. You can either access them at General Register House in Edinburgh on computers, or you can access them online through scotlandspeople.gov.uk. And these are what these Scottish testaments look like, uh, particularly for the 16th century. This is a particularly nice uh, secretary hand. There are some real... Uh, real awful ones that just make you want, uh, when you're sitting in the, in the archives, you know, sort of thinking, I only have a finite amount of time in these archives. Uh, this clerk is just making me want to die, and I wish I could go back and give him a good kick. <laughs> Anyways, now in terms of the mechanics of early modern Scottish testaments, after the Reformation in 1560, these are written in Scots. And like I say, they're written in a, uh, in a particular type of hand known as Scottish secretary hand. And they fall into two categories. They can either be dative or testamentar. Now, testament dative wills are those which were written after the death of a person. So they contain in particular a preamble stating who the person was, whether or not they were married, where they lived, that sort of thing. Um, and following that preamble, they, can, they contain an inventory of the testator's goods. They also contain a list of debts that are owed 
to him or her, and a list of debts that are owed by him or her. But in terms of testaments dative, because these are wills that are drawn up after a per person's death, they don't contain bequests. Testaments testamentor, meanwhile, they are the ones that were written while the testator was still alive. And in addition to the four distinct sections contained in a testament dative, testaments testamentor also contain a latter will and legacy section. And this is the section where bequests can be found. So as a result, uh, testamentor testaments are usually longer and more detailed. Now, the first section of a testament after the preamble is the inventory. Now, inventories ostensibly list the goods that are owned by, testator, by uh, the testator at the time of his or her death. But in reality, particularly in Scotland, they often omitted certain goods. They often simplified the actual amounts and types of other goods. So for example, they refer to clothes and personal items under the catch-all term of abouliments or ornaments, for example. And so they can't be relied upon to be consistent in their recording of items. Also, inventories are typically limited to lists of valuable items. So in these inventories, we see amounts of wine, which, unlike beer and ale, could be kept long enough to be included in, in an inventory. We also see uh, lists of cloth, again, because it, it, was, it would last. We see uh, items of merchandise. Sometimes that, that merchandise is spelled out as, a, as to what it actually is. Sometimes it's just sort of grouped together under a catch-all term of merchandise. And finally, we also see uh, lists of ready money, so how much actual money the testator had in his or her possession at, at their death. Now, inheritance laws also decreed that certain items, such as brewing equipment, for example, would pass immediately and without question to a testator's heir. And so as a result of that law, this negates the needs of these items being entered into an inventory. And so these, this, this is one of the uh, limitations of these early modern wills. Now, the second section of a testament, that section that lists the debts owed to the testator, that typically lists debts for food and drink, it li lists uh, debts for house rent or merchandise, or lent money, all of which had, would have been supplied to the testator by others. Now, in turn, in the third, in the third section of the testament, we see the debts that are owed, uh, owed to a testator. Oh, oh, sorry, so the second section is owed, the debts owed by the testator. The third section, we see the debts owed to the testator. And that third section typically lists debts for the same sorts of items as in the second section. but. Uh, but which have been uh, which have been provided uh, um, to the t uh, sorry have been provided to others by the testator. So as a result, together these second and third sections can often be used to help determine what sort of employment or economic role the testator had played uh, during his or her life. Now the value of the inventory, together with the value of the debts owed to the testator is then added together at the bottom of the testament to give a value of the entire estate. And some of these estates can be quite large. I'll talk, about, I'll talk more about uh, a few particular ones in a moment. Now, the fee for providing the testament is then noted, as was whether the estate was to be divided into two or three parts. And if we get three parts, those parts are the dead's part, so the amount or the part, portion of the testament that the testator could just sort of bequeath as they saw fit, the spouse's part, which was the part of the testament that was required to go to the testator's husband or wife, and the baron's part, so the part that was, was designated for children. Now these three parts can uh, comprise the part of the estate that the testator uh, is able to bequeath as, as they wish, the part that the testator is required to leave to his or her spouse, and the part that the testator is required to leave to his or her children. 
Now, a latter will and legacy, if it's a testament testamentar, um, is then set out before the section identifying where the testament was proved at the end of the document. Now, latter wills and legacies are the part of testaments where the person might commend his or her soul to God or nominate a spouse, child, or sibling as his or her executor. And this section can be especially helpful in determining what personal items the testator owned, thanks to the bequests that are set out by him or her for amounts of money, for items of clothing, for items of jewelry. And in particular, this final section allows a person to highlight any personal items which he or she held in particular esteem, as the majority of personal items are usually grouped together in an inventory and not discussed in greater detail. So all of the sections of a testament are useful for gleaning information about early modern Scottish women. The preamble and the latter will and legacy tell us about information about a woman's marital status. The debts owing by her and to her give us information about her business activities. And it was very common for women in 16th century Scotland to be involved in businesses and employments. And finally, the latter will and legacy gives information about personal relationships through those bequests that, were ma that women made. And Scottish women are extremely keen to make wills in this period. Unlike in England, where married, married women's will making is declining markedly from the middle of the 14th century to the point that, they will be, that married women's wills will be extremely rare by the 16th century. Unlike England in that regard, married women in Scotland continue to make wills in great numbers through the 16th century and beyond. However, as I mentioned earlier, at this point in Scottish history, a woman was required by law to obtain her husband's consent before writing her will. Now this was because a married woman's property was not actually considered hers. Because upon her marriage, a wife surrendered to her husband control of her movable property. And this movable property including the rents of her heritable property, the produce of annuities and interest on money, which have been loaned on personal bond. Upon a wife's death, however, her heritable estate passed to her heirs, but her husband was left with the right of administration. This meant that until that husband died or remarried, he could enjoy the legal right to the life rent of his wife's estate. And this applied if she had died but, and had given birth to a living baby, whether, or not that, whether that child survived or not. Now, for some historians, this stipulation is similar to the common law doctrine known as coverture, which was in place in England in the same period. Although this is under debate, there are those that argue, and, and increasingly myself, uh, those that argue that this, this legal coverture didn't apply uh, didn't apply in Scotland like it did in England. At any rate, it was not until 1882 that married women were given the legal right to own and control property in England, Wales, and Ireland. And similar rights would not be given in Scotland until 1920. So we have, the, we have what the laws and the books um, that state one thing, and we, uh, and, and we need to, to see whether or not that was the case in practice. Now, a husband, on the other hand, was required by law to make provisions for his wife in his will if the two had been married for at least a year and a day. And he's required to make provisions for his wife regardless uh, of whether he wants to or not. So even if no will by a husband existed, a widow was entitled, after all debts had been paid, to a third of her husband's movables on his death if there were no children. She's entitled to half. Oh, sorry, a third on, uh, uh, of, on his death if there were children. She's entitled to a half of his goods if there, were, if there weren't any children. Now, although a husband was required to make provisions for his wife in his will, this arrangement was not reciprocal. Unlike her husband, 
A wife is not required to leave anything to her husband or to make provisions for her children in her testament. So there's sort of a, there's sort of a, a, a double standard on both sides. Wives require their husband's consent to make a will, but they're pretty much free to test as they want, as, as they wish. Husbands don't require anyone's consent to make a will, but there are these legal provisions that they have to provide for their wife and for their children. In most cases, however, women choose to divide their estates into thirds or into halves and to make bequests to the benefits of their husbands, their children, other relatives, and friends and, employ and employees. And in doing so, they pass on sums of money, they pass on household items, um, and they pass on clothing and jewelry. Now, with all this sort of legal, legalese set aside, what is really interesting about wills written by women in early modern Scotland is, like I say, despite the fact that married women's wills are, are now a rarity in England in the 16th century, by contrast, married women, in, uh, married women are the largest group of female testators in Scotland uh, in the 16th century. That married women's testaments include inventories in which they list the goods under their control and the fact that they include ladder wills and legacies in which they bequeath items means that not only are the will-making activities of Scottish women and Scottish married women in particular deserving of being more closely examined for this period and for this place. But it, this also means that the prevailing assumption that a husband controlled the family's belongings has to be reconsidered. A close examin examination of these testaments paints a clearer picture of how married women thought of and controlled the items that they particularly regarded as their own. How these women chose to disseminate their worldly goods, the exhortations and rebukes that accompany these bequests, these all provide a window into the activities that these women engaged in during their lives, it provides a window into early modern gender relations and family bonds. Now, I've been working with these testaments for quite a few years now. I was thinking about it yesterday, and it's actually been 14 years since I started working with testaments, which seems an incredibly long time. Um, they formed the basis of my MA work. They contributed to my PhD. And most recently, testaments have formed the basis of a project being take, undertaken by me and Dr. Cordelia Beattie at the University of Edinburgh. And in particular, we're examining the will-making practices of married women in Scotland uh, between 1550 and 1600. Now, the National Records of Scotland holds over 14,000 testamentary documents for this period for Scotland. And over 7,000 of these documents are testaments testamentar. Now, of the 7,000 testaments that survive for 16th century Scotland, nearly Three quarters, so 72.6%, were written by men, while 27.4% were written by women. Now, preliminary analysis of the NRS's database of this material suggests that married women were the largest group of female testators. Married women make up 21% of all female testators, or 5.7% of all testators. Meanwhile, 20%, another 20% of female testators, or 5.6% of all testators, are described as widows. And finally, as you can see there, 17% uh, of, uh, of wills written by women are written by uh, women who are identified as uh, something other than wives or widows. Now, you'll notice there that there's a big part of that pie chart missing, the majority of that pie chart, actually. And that's because 42% of female testators, a full 11.5% of all testators, are identified in the opening lines of their testaments as sometimes spouses. All of these sometimes spouses are located in the Edinburgh and St. Andrew's Commissary Court registers. So there's been a, 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 a debate 
or a sort of an uncertainty over the years of what these sometime spouses are. Are they widows? Had they sometime been a spouse? What were they? Well, Dr. Beatty and I checked, have checked over 100 of these sometime spouse wills. And what we found is that all of these sometime spouses are actually wives. Now, what they are is they're wives that have been married at least one time before they die. So they've been married, that husband has died, they've married again, and as a result, they get the designation of sometime spouse in their testament. So like I say, all of these sometime spouses, they're actually wives at the time of making their wills. As a result of that, the proportion of wives making wills in 16th century Scotland rises to 63% of all female testators and 17.2% of all testators. Now this would be an important finding in and of itself, but detailed analysis of a significant sample of testaments, and especially those testaments testamenter with their inventories, uh, enables an insight into what women, and in particular married women, their husbands and the courts, thought of women's property and therefore women's power in the 16th century. Further to this, the information contained in, the t in these testaments can illustrate how married couples worked, to worked together or independently of one another in a number of economic and social pursuits. So consider, for example, the example of Elizabeth Stevenson of Edinburgh. Elizabeth was obviously quite involved in the cloth industry with her husband, Alexander Park. And I'll mention at this point that uh, early modern Scottish women retain their natal surnames even after marriage. However, any children from that marriage would take the surname of their father. So if Elizabeth and Alexander have a daughter, her name would usually be Elizabeth Park. It makes, it, it makes following a woman through the records uh, very easy. It makes following her lineage, it makes following sort of her descendants rather challenging if you don't know the name of the, of the father. Now contained in the inventory of Elizabeth's testament is an extensive list of various amounts and types of cloth. So she lists serge cloth, red and black velvet, black and purple satin, and a variety of colors of taffeta. Now, altogether, the inventory of her goods comes to over 3,000 pounds. And this sum jumps to an impressive 12,000 pounds when the debts owing to her, which included a variety of debts owed by tailors who would likely purchase the cloth that Elizabeth and her husband were bringing to Edinburgh, were factored in. Now, Jonah Dick was another Edinburgh woman who was obviously also involved in the cloth industry with her husband, John Hamilton. And that's because the inventory of Jonah's testament contains an extensive list of various amounts and types of cloth, including velvet, satin, and taffeta. And altogether, the value of that inventory is calculated to be nearly 1,300 pounds, an amount which grows to over 2,000 pounds when all the debts owing to Jonah are totaled. Now it's important to note that not all of the types of cloth mentioned in Jonah's inventory were native to Scotland. There is evidence in this inventory that she and her husband were importing cloth from the countries of England, Holland, and France because her inventory contains descriptions such as tanny English war sail, remains of Holland cloth, and lion's canvas. Now this indicates that Jonah and her husband were importing various types of cloth, indicating a degree of wealth over other sellers of cloth because this importation would have required them to own the share of a ship or to hire the use of a ship. Now in the 16th century, transporting cargo entailed owning a share of a ship. Um, there are no, uh, no cases of entire ship uh, ownership exist. 
So you would have had to own a share of a ship or hire the use of a ship or the services of a master to see the contents of a ship delivered. Now, the cost associated with doing so would have been exorbitant. And as a result, a merchant might accompany his cargo or go abroad on business. However, there's no mention of wives traveling abroad. Instead, it tended to be the husbands who traveled. The wives tended to, be, to, to remain at home to run the business. But while wives didn't travel, they did use what were known as factors. Because when goods were sent abroad, they were often sent in venture with a factor or agent. So this factor not only saw the goods safely landed, but they also handled the sale of those goods in a foreign country and made purchases with the proceeds, which they would then bring back to Scotland. Now, substantial merchants might use several factors. And often, these factors were trusted members of the merchant's family or, her, or his or her extended family. And indeed, Jonah Dick, in her testament, refers to items in the hand of Henry Todd in Dieppe, her factor. And in particular, he, he has in his hands 365 pounds, six shillings and eight pence, as well as amounts of herring, amounts of salmon, um, and in addition, skins, or three, uh, 300 skins, which are in the hands um, of another man, uh, James Cooper in Flanders, who may have been, her factor may have been someone else's factor. But certainly, there's evidence of international trade uh, that Jonas engaged in. So, it's clear that Jonas and her husband are using a factor in their dealings in France. And interestingly, Jonas' factor, Henry Todd, was also affiliated with Jonas' brother, Gilbert Dick. This indicates that not only did fam family members collaborate with each other as they imported and exported goods, but also that their factors were in touch with one another as they traveled abroad. Now, other women may have engaged in overseas trade independent of their husbands. When Helen Quinton called family and friends together in February of 1589 to make out her testament, her business interests were clearly uppermost in her mind. The very first item listed in Helen's inventory of her goods is the half-quarter ownership in a ship in the harbor of Leith, which was located just outside the town of Edinburgh, is located just outside of Edinburgh. Now, given that Helen's husband, Adam Hennessley, was a mariner, it is possible that the two were in business together and that they shared between them this quarter ownership of a ship. However, later in her latter will and legacy, or so later in her testament in her latter will and legacy, Helen bequeaths her half quarter ownership in the ship to her youngest son, another Adam, indicating that this share of a ship was Helen's and Helen's alone. She, can, she owns it, she can bequeath it uh, as, she, as she sees fit. Now, other items listed in a wife's inventory and bequeathed in her legacy were clearly hers and hers alone. I've mentioned that upon marriage, a woman's movable property, with some exceptions, falls under the control of her husband. But there were exceptions to this rule. The first exception is in regards to heritable or immovable property, usually called real property, what we would today consider property. So a married woman could not dispose of her heritable or unmovable, immovable property without her husband's consent. But neither could her husband depose, dispose of that property without her consent. So they need, each needs the other's consent to do anything with it. Secondly. Married women maintain control of what's known as their paraphernalia, their personal chattels throughout their life, throughout their marriage. Now, as a consequence of this, there is an emphasis on these items, such as clothing and jewelry, in women's wills. Now, in Scottish testaments, this paraphernalia is usually described as abulimens and ornamentus. 
in the, uh, of the body in the inventory and goes largely unspecified. But in the case of women, these personal items are typically expanded upon later in their testaments. And at that point, they appear in the latter will and legacy section as bequests of clothing and jewelry. Now, the most common good bequeathed by women was clothing, which was obviously typically passed on to other women. So Martha Blackwood, for example, who died in April of 1567, carefully portioned out her clothing to her sisters. So her older sister Margaret receives a black kirtle, her sister Helen receives a pair of black cloaks, and Isabel, another sister, receives a black velvet partlet. So a kirtle would sort of be an over, a, a sort of an overskirt. Uh, a partlet is, is sometimes you see them, um, the, the bits that sort of come around the, the throat and down over a woman's shoulders um, in Elizabethan dress. Now similarly, Helen Brown, who died in 1572, she left a woman named Christian Byrne her best kirtle. She left the slightly less fortunate Elizabeth Byrne her next best kirtle. I just, you just get to wonder about stuff like that. Like, you know, is she sort of, like, is, is, there's, a, there's a hierarchy going on here, clearly. Um, and finally, Christian Brown, who died in May of 1588, she left a number of different items of different clothing to a variety of female relatives. She left her best cloak of French black, a pair of sheets, and her belt with a silver ring to her sister, Marion. She left her best kirtle of French black, uh, another pair of sheets, a cloak of Scottish black, and a silver ring to a niece. She left a kirtle of French black with long sleeves to a second niece, and an old kirtle of French black to a third niece. But one item, or one aspect of wills which has not changed, regardless of religion or even time, is the importance of bequeathing items to children. Children played an important part in the latter will and legacies of these 16th century Scottish wills. Daughters and sons, in some cases, were often given articles of clothing and jewelry which had belonged to their mothers. So Joan and Fleming, who died in October of 1570, she names three daughters, Alison, Isabel, and Marion, and one son, William, as the chief beneficiaries of her testament. Now, Jonet states that the four children are to divide among themselves all of her goods and gear, as well as to be the recipients of any debts that have been owing to her at the time of her death, which had been repaid, since been repaid. Now, in addition to these bequests, Joan had also dictates that her jewelry was to be divided among these three daughters and one son. Interestingly, however, a fourth daughter, a woman named Joan at Crake, is mentioned at this junction in the Testament. And Joan is bequeathed all of her mother's rings. Now, there appears to have been some friction between Joan at Fleming and her daughter, Joan at Crake. Because Jonet the testator goes on to bequeath Jonet the daughter and Jonet the daughter's husband 300 marks of Baron's part, of children's part. And Jonet the daughter is still owed this 300 marks following the death of her father, which clearly happened uh, uh, a, a long time earlier. However, Jonet Fleming makes the specific stipulation that should her daughter Jonah Craig or Jonah Craig's husband be dissatisfied with this amount of 300 marks and attempt to procure any more money from her mother's estate, that the 300 marks should be rescinded and Jonah should receive nothing. Now, Beatrix Ramsey had similar concerns at the forefront of her mind when she made her testament in 1589. Now, Beatrix, in her testament, explicitly cites a desire to minimize potential friction between her current husband and her daughters from a previous marriage. 
because Beatrix begins the legacy section of her testament by stating the following. And willing after her departure that no controversy nor question of law should be between her husband and barons, her husband and children. Therefore, she, with her own mouth, leaves to, Eliz leaves to Isabel and Elizabeth Andersons, her daughters, lawfully gotten between her and her uh, and uncle, deceased James Anderson, her first husband, each of those daughters, the sum of 100 merks. And this sum of 200 merks left by her to her said daughters is in complete payment and satisfaction of all barons part of gear, legacy, debts, goods, gear, and others whatsoever, which they can claim or require through her decease and through the decease of their said deceased father. So with these words, what Beatrix is doing is she's making explicit the fulfillment of the barons part, the children's part, that these two daughters are owed. And she is explicitly stating that no further claims should be made to Beatrix's second husband, a man by the name of William Newton. Now, perhaps out of a desire of fairness uh, towards all her children, Beatrix also leaves her son from that second marriage a monetary bequest of 100 marks. So the same amount that's bequeathed to those two sisters. All the kids get 100 marks, so there's no sort of fighting between them, ideally. Now, Elizabeth Jack was even stricter when attempting to limit strife between her second husband, a man named Patrick Dogood, and her daughter from her first marriage, a woman named Griselle Wilson. Now, Elizabeth bequeaths to Griselle and her husband, Donald Ritchie, 100 marks. She forgives a debt of 24 pounds, and she leaves to Griselle several items of clothing, some cloth, and some household goods. Now the mother makes it clear that her daughter Griselle and her son-in-law Donald cannot expect to receive any more from her estate using the explicit threat. If Donald Ritchie or Griselle Wilson trouble, molest, follow, or pursue the said Patrick Dogood, my spouse, for any farther sums, goods, or gear, nor is above written. I discharge them of any part of my goods or gear and leave the same to the said Patrick Dogood, my spouse. It's sort of that classic, if you're going to fight over it, I'm going to take it and give it all to him, which is just awesome. <laughs> now, other women used their testaments to encourage what they saw as proper behavior in the husbands they were leaving behind. And they do this especially in cases where those husbands would be charged uh, with looking after children. Kind of a, you know, kind of makes sense. So in January of 1588, when Janet Dickinson makes Thomas Ferd, her husband, the executor of her latter will and legacy, she called upon him to use that office and put the goods and gear that she had left behind to quote, the utility and profit of my barons, my children, gotten between John Sanderson, my uncle husband, my deceased husband, and me. If he didn't do this, if he didn't take, uh, if he didn't take those, those goods and gear and, and use them uh, for the benefit of those, of those children, Janet is very clear. He'll answer to God, <laughs> calling in a higher power. Janet then bequeaths her third of goods to the, uh, the children of her first marriage and stipulates that they be divided equally. Now, the wording in this testament certainly implies that Janet had some doubts regarding Thomas's desire to care for his stepchildren or that there were limits to what she could offer the children of her first marriage and is therefore trying to persuade her second husband, their stepfather, to give the children more. Now, other stepfathers are charged even more explicitly with attending to the future of their stepchildren. When Marion Reed prepared her legacy in 1589, she named William Lay as her husband and John Porteous, her son, as her executors. <laughs> 
Now further, Marian bequeaths her son 350 marks, and that's in complete payment of 800 marks that he was uh, bequeathed in his father's testament, in his deceased father's testament. But she takes that 350 marks and she divides it up into two portions. So Marian in particular stipulates that half of those 350 marks is to be laid in land. And what that does is that means that that 350 marks is to be invested in land for profit. The other half is to be employed as her second husband feels profitable while John resides with him. And John is to reside with his stepfather until the age of 18. Now for John's further benefit, Marion leaves her son a silver belt, a golden ring, a silver spoon, and her best gown and cloak. And you might wonder what he's going to do with his, best, his mother's best gown and cloak. Well, all of those items are to be sold to a woman named Catherine Crichton for an amount uh, of 20 pounds. And she also appoints her brother, Alexander Reed, as overseer for her son. So in this capacity, Marion decrees that Alexander Reed will receive 400 marks from William Leas, from the stepfather, to again lay on land for John's benefit. So although Marion is willing to trust her husband to administer the estate, she feels it necessary to explicitly provision for her son's future. And she doesn't just, so she doesn't just leave those provisions to the discretion of the stepfather and uncle. She sort of sets out, sets out exactly what is to be done. Further, she doesn't just trust the stepfather. She also calls in the uncle as an overseer to make sure that everything is, is uh, going well. Now, Janet Middlemas, who died in 1577, she also had a child from a previous marriage. Now, that child was named Elizabeth Curl, and she's described in the Testament as an idiot and a fool, which seems to say that she was unable to, uh, unable to uh, 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 hear or speak. Now, aside from a few small bequests of goods and money, which she leaves to others, Jonah leaves her whole portion of goods to her daughter in order to sustain her throughout her life. And Jonah names her current husband as her executor and as the administrator and the guider of his stepdaughter, Elizabeth. Now further, Jonat charges her second husband with caring for his stepdaughter throughout her life, as he will, quote, answer to God on the ter terrible day of judgment if he does not. Because Jonat also describes Elizabeth as a mute, Jonat further entreats Patrick to act as her daughter's sessioner when Elizabeth dies. So essentially, she gives him the role of executor for her daughter. And in her testament, Jonah specifically expresses her worry over what will happen to Elizabeth should Patrick remarry. And she writes, quote, And if her spouse happens to marry hereafter and puts away the said Elizabeth Curl, her daughter, Firth or out of his house and company, she ordains him to give her all of her goods whatsoever and to put her with another curator. So Jonah attempts to use every legal resource at her disposal to ensure her daughter's continued care, either by her stepfather, ideally, or by someone else, if he decides, uh, if he decides not to do that. Now, the effective relations exhibited through testaments do not end with immediate family members. Rather, the affection between master and servant is another relationship that can be explored through wills. So testators also go beyond, sim often go sim beyond simply leaving their servants what they were due through the employer-employee contract. And instead, they elect to leave them personal items as well. So for example, in addition to leaving her servant Bessie Law the amount which was owing to her as her fee, as her wages of 68 shillings, Marion Brown, when she dies, also leaves Bessie her black gown, which she, presumably Marion, wore each day. Another woman, Margaret Richardson, who died in 1569, in addition to leaving items to her daughter, her son-in-law, and her nephew, she also leaves her servant, Jonat Bunch, 
a black kirtle, a gray mantle, oops, and five sleeves of linen and harden. Now these bequests would have then therefore served as a method to not only reward employees for services rendered during a testator's lifetime, but also to acknowledge uh, the depth of that relationship. So female servants are frequently left items of clothing by their female employers. And this is a particularly generous gift considering the cost of purchasing clothes or the cost of making clothes in this period. Now, as the bequest, these bequests are not mentioned in the debts owing by in two sections of the testaments, it's reasonable to assume that they were given as gifts, given by the testator to the servant in recognition of services rendered. Servants were, we think, typically young and unmarried and may have almost been adopted into the, fam into the, the family that they served in some situations. And indeed, in some cases, testaments which were prepared by servants mirror this amicable relationship. Usually, this is done by appointing their employer as executor of their testament. We see this, this frequently, that female servants appoint their employer as executor of their testament. And they do this rather than uh, bequeathing them any of their belongings. Usually, there are exceptions to that. Or they do this by requesting their presence at their bedside as they make out their latter will and legacy. Now, in terms of the testaments prepared by these young female servants, they do tend to be smaller, and their testaments do tend to be shorter than the inventories and testaments made by other will makers. And this indicates that many servants who made testaments had either not lived long enough to accumulate many goods, or that they lived with their employers and did not have the need or could not afford many items beyond a few personal possessions. And in this way, the experience of servants in, tes uh, uh, experience of servants in Scotland seems to have been very much like that of servants in England in roughly the same period. And servants in England have been described as owning little else than clothing and money. Now, inventories made by Scottish servants of their possessions and given up in their testaments typically include at least the ebulliments or clothing of the servants' bodies. Now, the inventory of Margaret Fallis's personal possessions, grouped together in her inventory under the phrase chamber gear and ebulliments of her body, for example, those are only valued at 10 marks. Other servants died owning more. So in addition to the ebulliments of her body, Catherine Scowler's inventory included utensils and domiciles. And so that denotes a variety of household goods. And indeed, her inventory was valued to over 230 pounds, which is quite significant for a servant's inventory. Janet Watt, meanwhile, who in her own latter will and legacy of her testament describes her inventory as being very mean and small, owned the ebulliments of her body, an old feather bed, sheets, blankets, and a chest, all of which were valued to 90 pounds. <coughs> Christian Patterson, a third servant, owned the ebulliments of her body and two gold rings. Her inventory was valued to just over 18 pounds. Now, a final indication of how much or how little property servants owned can be found in the bequests that they made to others. Now, in general, the bequests made by servants in their latter wills and legacies were for amounts of money rather than for items of clothing or jewelry. So it's sort of opposite to what we see uh, with regard to bequests of wives and widows who tend to give more things. Servants tend to give more money, probably because they had more money on hand. If you live uh, at the place you work and you're provided for food and, and lodging at the place you work, um, you don't have a, a huge, a huge need to sort of uh, to spend your money. You're, you're much uh, more able to save it. Now, an exception to this rule was the female uh, servant Christian Patterson, who, in addition to a variety of monetary bequests, she also leaves pairs of plaids. She leaves cloaks. She leaves gowns to a number of her beneficiaries. And likewise, in addition to monetary bequests, Margaret Kello leaves her new Scots black gown to Jonat Kello, 
and her each day gown to Helen Kello, presumably her sisters. Finally, the servant Janet Watt left a wily coat, an underskirt, to her half sister, and she leaves the rest of her clothes to her mistress. She leaves the rest of her clothes to her mistress to, quote, be used by her. So, testaments do much to illuminate the lives of early modern Scottish women. Not only can we examine the proportion of men and women who made testaments, we can also examine the marital statuses of those women who make these testaments. We can determine if they were wives or widows or single women. But what emerges is that even with the legal strictures in place, which were ostensibly there to prevent them making testaments, wives were actually the greatest proportion of female testators writing wills in Scotland. And more than that, they use this ability to their advantage. They stake claim on not only the items that they are allowed to own by law, but also items related to their businesses. They bequeath not only personal items, but they also use their latter wills and legacies to advocate for themselves and for their surviving children. More broadly, we can determine that it was not just upper class women who made wills in early modern Scotland. Rather, women from all social strata make wills, from aristocratic women to middling merchant wives to relatively poor female servants. These wills are very much articulations of an understanding of what power was and how to wield that power. And clearly, Scottish women knew how to do this very well. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Catherine. That was uh, fascinating stuff. Uh, it's a reminder again, just um, you know, how much can be learned from the paper trail that we leave behind in, in our lives, right? And how when you have skilled scholars doing the sort of CSI investigation uh, work, uh, you can draw out so much more and, and, and learn uh, so many really interesting things. And in this case, again, the sort of the more empowerment that uh, women in Scotland had than you might have think, thought otherwise. So uh, we do have some time for some questions. Uh, now normally what we do is uh, either Gordon Hack or I go around with handheld mics um, so that you know everyone can hear the question. Unfortunately because of the theater production that's just about to go underway all the handheld mics are otherwise uh, in use. So um, I'll still get you to raise your hand if you have a question but when you do, uh, and you're identified as the person who can ask the question at that time, you'll have to speak rather loudly uh, and assertively. Um, and perhaps, Catherine, if you hear the question, you might just repeat it into sure. the mic so that everyone can sort of hear it. Sure. While you're thinking about what you might like to ask Catherine, I do want to remind you that the third event in the...